Amen. Thank you, worship team, Beth, Lennon, and Berkeley. It's good. Well, welcome to Journey Church. It's good to see you again. Uh, if you're a first-time guest, it's really great to have you as well. We're just blessed by your presence, and we pray that this service today would bless your heart and would draw you closer to Jesus. Uh, it's been great for me to have some time off uh, from, the, from preaching. I was going to say the pulpit. I don't know if you'd call that a pulpit. Um, if you grew up in church, you probably do, but uh, it was good to have some time off. Uh, have only preached really once since Father's Day, and so um, it, it was good and refreshing uh, somebody this morning was like, man, this better be good. You've had three weeks. And I said, two of them I spent resting. So uh, he was kidding. But uh, so it's just really good to be back and uh, just for the foreseeable future to be able to break down God's word for us uh, together. And really actually very geek to do it. I could hardly sleep last night. So um, if you have a Bible, we're going to be in Jonah chapter three. That's where we'll be. And uh, when we began the series in Jonah, uh, two or three weeks ago, actually, when I started in Jonah chapter one, I mentioned that the reasons we're doing Jonah are multifaceted. Uh, it's a story. The first thing I said is that Jonah is a story about God. Like first and foremost, Jonah's a story about God, about his character. Yes, there's Jonah, there's a fish, the Ninevites. Yeah, they're all there, but they're secondary characters in this story. Jonah's a story about God, and Jonah itself is unique because it's about God calling a Hebrew prophet to actually leave Israel and preach to a pagan nation. That's just not typically how it worked, and many commentators actually say that, that Jonah's probably a bit of a foreshadowing of the New Testament, of God's call to his people to go and share the good news with the nations. There's a lot going on in Jonah. And I even mentioned a couple weeks ago that when I started studying it and reading it, more stuff jumped out of me than I even remembered being there. It's just so complex. It's a story about, you know, who we actually perceive are the good guys and the bad guys. It's a story about rebellion and mercy. It's a story about sin and grace. And today, those themes are going to come into kind of a sharper focus for us. Uh, today in Jonah 3, just going to set you up from the get-go, our modern sensibilities are going to be challenged a little bit. Our modern sense, like things that we're kind of sensitive about, they'll be challenged today. Whether it's the actual type of preaching that Jonah does or the response of the Ninevites to that kind of preaching will challenge us a little bit. It will be challenged about what God actually calls out in Nineveh and how they responded to him and how he responds to their response to him. It's going to be for a lot of us today, there's going to be some categories busted. There's going to be some things that we're like, no, normally this is how this works and normally this is how that works and that's just not going to be the case. We're going to see today some challenges. And in the first chapter, we saw that beneath the waves of the storm that God sent when Jonah ran was actually a profound mercy and love for Jonah and the pagan sailors that he employed. Today in Jonah 3, we will see a threat of more destruction. And the question today is this, with the threat of destruction, is it even possible for God to show mercy now. Can God be a just God and show mercy at the same time? To wicked Nineveh? Can he be a just God and show mercy to, to wicked Nineveh? Can he be a just God and show mercy to his rebellious prophet? Can he be a just God and show mercy to you, to me? That's the question that we're going to be looking at. And to properly allow God's word to challenge us today, let's kind of frame this passage, Jonah 3, in these three ways. We're going to see God's powerful word of justice, Nineveh's repentant decree for justice, and then God's mysterious mercy. God's powerful word of justice Nineveh's repentant decree for justice 
and then God's mysterious mercy. So first, God's word of justice. Let's pick it up in chapter 3, verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. The word of the Lord comes to Jonah a second time, and it looks a lot like the first time. Go to Nineveh, give them my word. The first time God calls Jonah to go to Nineveh, in chapter 1, verse 1, we know that it's because he wants Jonah to preach against it. Here's what he says in chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it. Why? Because its wickedness has come up before me. The initial call to, is, for Jonah is to preach against Nineveh because of their wickedness. Now, we know now that he's going to actually give Jonah what directly he wants him to say. And so this doesn't appear that it's going to be a pleasant message from God to the Ninevites. And it's interesting because this is not how we do things in the South when we don't really want to talk to somebody. You know how we do. Hey, how you doing? How's your mom doing? Have mercy on her. Oh, bless her heart. That's how we typically engage people that we really don't want to engage, but just like, oh, yeah, like we're just kind of polite. Uh, and the rest of the day, you probably are going to be sitting here thinking like, has he done that to me? Does he even like me? Um, but that's just how it is. Like we know that's how it is, but that's not going to be the case here. Jonah wasn't going to go make small talk with his enemies. He wasn't going to go to the capital of Assyria, one of the most brutal and cruel nations in history, to exchange pleasantries and kind of beat around the bush like world leaders might do today in their visits with one another. No, Jonah was going to go give God his word. He was going to give them God's word. And by what God had told him at this point, the word from God was likely going to be one of judgment. Preach against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. So, now that Jonah has had somewhat of a change of course, he's been in the belly of the fish, he's been in a storm, and now he's ready to obey the Lord. Notice what it says in verse 3 of chapter 3. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. God says, go. And this time, Jonah says, yes, Lord. He goes and he makes his way through this massive city. And what was the message that apparently God told Jonah to give? Look at verse four. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's it. That's the sermon. Some of you are like, you need to take more notes after Jonah. We'd be already ready to be singing by now. My wife is like, I like direct communication. My mother-in-law even last night was like, why do you preach so long? People, this is a short sermon. It's to the point. And here's the deal. It's very direct. You can't get much more direct than what Jonah just did. One day into a city that takes three days to venture throughout, and Jonah is going street by street. 40 more days, y'all are toast. Goes over to Main Street, all y'all are gonna die. Goes over here to First Street, only 40 more days, and then y'all are gonna be overthrown. Takes a left on Park Avenue. You got 40 days until life's over for you. Have a great day. This is the sermon. And now most commentators believe that this is actually probably a distillation of what the actual sermon was. Like it was probably a little more nuanced. They may have had some engagement with him, questions about who sent you? Is there any shot for mercy? We, we don't know. What we do know from the author of Jonah is that it was distilled down into, the sermon was 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That was the gist of the message that God gave Jonah. God gave Jonah to deliver a message of wrath. More specifically, God gave his prophet a word of justice. 
And this type of sermon often is a challenge for modern people like us. Like we hear preaching like this and we think of that street preacher on Beale Street with the megaphone and the sign who's just hollering at all of the people on a Saturday night that they're destined for hell. I remember seeing him or her in college. Even then, I was a child of God, but I was running from God. And I remember thinking like, bro, this is not going to work. They're going to ignore you. They're going to fight you. Or they're just going to scoff at you. But this, this type of preaching doesn't work. We hear messages like this of turn or burn, and it's our stomachs that turn. It's unsettling. And really, I mean, it should be. It should be unsettling. But part of the unsettling nature of these types of messages is the demeanor of the preacher, often self-righteous, often smug. And from the looks of chapter four, which we'll delve into next week, and from what we've already seen in chapter one, a smug and self-righteous preacher is what we have here, most likely. Jonah is there and we can see that there is a certain unsettledness about the actual preacher preaching that type of message. Jonah didn't want to be there. I mean, he didn't really want to warn them of impending doom. He would rather have just God destroy them. And the only thing he would have said is, hold on, let me get there so I can see it first. That's what Jonah wanted. And so for us, I think we, we get unsettled with these types of messages for that reason. But we also get unsettled because we have kind of a partial understanding of what the Bible means by justice or what it means by God's judgment. If you just read the Psalms, you read Proverbs, you read the prophets, you will see that they actually longed for the justice of God. Like they looked forward to God judging the earth. Here's just a small sample. Look at Psalm 37, 28 and 29. For the Lord loves the just and will not forsake his faithful ones. Wrongdoers will be completely destroyed. The offspring of the wicked will perish. The righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it forever. I'll give you a guess who, the psalm, who you think the psalmist is in this passage. The righteous, the one that's looking forward to the justice of God. How about Proverbs 21, 15? When justice is done, it brings joy to the righteous, but terror to the evildoer. I mean, I could imagine this was in Jonah's mind, looking forward to that justice. How about Amos 5, 24? This is a very famous passage. But let justice roll on like a river righteousness like a never failing stream or how about Isaiah 61 8 for I the Lord love justice I hate robbery and wrongdoing you can see he's juxtaposing that robbery and wrongdoing are opposite of justice and my faithfulness I will reward my people and make an everlasting covenant with them the Israelites were keen on a God of justice why well, first, because they were constantly oppressed by the Assyrians, the Babylons, the Romes of the world. And they understood, Israel did, that God coming to judge meant God was coming to make things right. He was going to bind up their wounds. He was going to crush their oppressor. Good would triumph over evil. You see this even in the way the disciples engaged with Jesus, what they expected him to come and do. And Israel believed that they were on the right side of this equation, that despite their faults, despite their sin, despite their waywardness, they believed that they would be upstream when the justice of God rolled on like a river. And before you think to yourself like, God, that's pretty arrogant of them, you have to remember that secondly, they were the covenant nation of God in the Old Testament. But rarely do we see them actually understand what that vocation really meant for them. Because it wasn't to keep God to themselves, but it was for them to be a light to the nations around them. So that the nations around them would see the beauty and the safety and the flourishing of what it meant for a group of people to live under the rule and reign of a loving and gracious God. 
They were to welcome in the foreigner. They were to take care of the fatherless. They were to help the widow. They were to care for the poor. In short, they were to be righteous. They were to live justly because Yahweh, their God, was a just God. His ways are always good, always right, always perfect. And when a nation like Assyria was cruel, vile, wicked, oppressive, and violent, God sent them a message. Enough is enough, 40 days, and Nineveh, the massive capital of the most powerful nation of its day, would be overthrown, says the Hebrew prophet. God's word of justice. And sometimes, as we all know, it's the warning the dire straits that actually confront our realities and our sensibilities and bring about change in our lives. We know all the facts about what we should eat, what we shouldn't eat. But it's the health diagnosis that we didn't expect that actually gets us serious about our health. It's that tough conversation with your spouse or your significant other that reveals how sick maybe your relationship actually is and it wakes you up to the work and attention your relationship needs. It's that performance review with your boss that you thought would go well and it did not. And it causes you to give more devotion and attention to your work. It's those blue flashing lights in your rear view only to find out they were going after the other guy. But you start to focus on your own speed and driving habits. Or like I felt this week, it's the death of someone that you knew, someone not far from your age, that makes you realize yet again just the brevity of life. Sometimes it's the bad news that prompts a heart to actually hear the truth and apply the necessary attention needed to that situation. And nothing is more attention grabbing than the word of God's justice that you and I have been acting unjustly and now God's gonna come make it right. This was God's word of justice spoken by Jonah. It was a sobering word, but it was a powerful word too. Let's look at the ramifications. Pick it up in verse five. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. Do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Sometimes when the word of God's justice comes in his sovereignty and at a time and place that's ripe for a harvest, full-fledged repentance happens. This has happened numerous times across history. And sometimes the results are long lasting and quite profound where you could only say, man, that was a work of God. And sometimes it only creates worldly guilt, a reprieve of evil ways for a time. But either way, when it is a word that is given by God in a specific moment, it can bear fruit. And that's what we see in Nineveh. <clears throat> Nineveh responds with their own call for justice. The cruel and brutal nation does a complete about face. Well before Jonah even completes his three-day preaching circuit through the town, Nineveh proclaims a fast. They put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least, from the present to the king, from the man, woman, and child to the beast in the field. This is a full scale Repentance. And what are they exactly repenting of? Look at verse 8. This is the king's words. This is not God's words. This is the king's words. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. The original Hebrew, not that I'm a Hebrew scholar, but I do have blueletterbible.com. 
.org. Uh, the original Hebrew is a little more literally turn from the violence which, violence which is in his hands. Their way of living was so wicked that life deteriorated to the point that they had come to violence in their hands in Nineveh. Violence against one another. Alec Motyer remarks it like this, in a world created by a good God, evil and injustice are inherently self-destructive. Here's what he means by that, I think. When you have God, a good, holy, righteous God creating the universe, creating within the fabric of our world is goodness and justness. And when we in our humanity rebel against that, we live in our way, we do things the way we want, we are literally ripping the fabric apart of a good world and it's self-destructive. Romans 1 talks somewhat about the wrath of God, sometimes it's passive. Like he just gives us what we want. And you see that this is actually becoming self-destructive and it's evident in Nineveh. This was a wicked and an extremely unjust society. But upon hearing the powerful word of God through Jonah, they're turning from that. And notice what I mentioned earlier about the themes in Jonah, about perceived good people and bad people. Often in this story, it's the pagans who actually have more understandable and right reaction to the revelation of God compared to God's prophet. Jonah runs from God's call in chapter one. It takes a storm for him to get, come to grips with what he's doing. But the pagan sailors, they fear God immediately. They make vows, offer sacrifices and worship while Jonah's thrown in the sea. And here you go, chapter three, Jonah preaches wrath and they immediately repent. They show a fear of a God that they don't really know. Jacques Ulul remarks about Nineveh's repentance this way. Here's what he says. Nineveh, with its holy warlike orientation, actually accuses itself of violence. Nineveh, proud of its power and its invincibility, now ceases to be itself when it humbles itself. Their identity changed overnight. What prompted such a change? that an entire city would cease to be what defined it. Well, the same thing that prompts any repentance. Look at verse five again. The Ninevites believed God. That's it. They believed God. We see in Jonah and we hear about a lot of actions or deeds of sin. We see sin, like literally a picture of sin and Jonah running away from God's word and his call. We see deeds of sin just in the Ninevites themselves, wicked deeds, evil deeds, violent deeds. But before sinful actions and deeds, in your hands is a false belief that takes root in your heart. Before sinful deeds hit your hands or your mind, there's a false belief in your heart. For Jonah, in his heart, you can tell he didn't believe God because God says that none are righteous, no, not one, but Jonah was self-righteous bigoted against the Assyrians and completely rebellious in a lot of ways. For Nineveh, they believed they could flex their power however they wanted, they were successful. Who's gonna, when they're like the river that's flowing downstream, no one's gonna stand up to Nineveh and now they have brought on a fast from the king on down by this fishy smelling Hebrew prophet. And here's the deal, it's the same for us today. When you look at your life, and you see sinful actions or attitudes, underneath all of that is a false belief. Underneath it all is an exchange in your heart of a truth for a lie. It's a swap. So where are you today? Like when you look at your life and you see sinful actions or attitudes what do you see in your heart? 
What sin in your life do you not just need to regret, but you need to abandon? You need to put it to death. Where do you need to believe God? And we could spend a lot of time on this, but I just have a few examples. Like maybe for you, it's anger. Like you believe you're in a position to to be a righteous judge over someone, to hold them in your contempt. But what does God say? He says, vengeance is his. He says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Are you dealing with anger? Brothers and sisters, the first step is to believe God. Maybe it's greed or coveting. Like you believe you deserve all that you have, maybe even more than you have. And you covet because you believe that that thing, that person, that trip, that whatever, will actually finally fulfill the deepest longings of your heart. So you sacrifice everything for it, even maybe people that you love. But what does God say? He says that everything you have has been given to you by him. Even your gifts, even your work ethic, all of it. It's a gift to glorify him and to bless others. And he does say that he wants to give you life abundantly. But in Luke, he says, life doesn't, doesn't really consist of the abundance of possessions. Do you struggle with greed? Do you struggle with covetousness? The first step is to believe God. To believe God. Or maybe for you, it's lust or desire you believe that you'll be satisfied this time by having a real or imagined relationship with someone that is designed and blessed by God only in the context of marriage, but you believe that that person is yours to have, exploit, and use, and you would never say those words. You would never say those words. But a pastor friend of mine, he says it like this. The reality is lust is saying to someone, I love your body, but I hate your soul. What does God say? That we were all made in the image of God with immense value. And we're not to be used or exploited by one another for selfish gain or to fulfill some desire, but instead to show one another dignity, honor, love, respect. Brothers and sisters, what are you struggling with in your life? Because I'm telling you, underneath it all is a false belief in your heart. Would you believe God? It's the beginning of repentance. Because you see, the nature of sin begins with a false belief, but the path to mercy begins with believing in God. It's that simple. In a lot of ways, it's that simple. It's sometimes hard to flesh out. Some of those beliefs are really deep. But the path to mercy is to believe God. God, believe it or not, loves to show mercy. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. And showing mercy comes naturally to God. I wish I had time to flush it out. I don't. Um, But even if you read like Lamentations 3, he says that he does not afflict from his heart. That what comes most naturally for God is not to afflict. Mercy is natural so natural, it's actually mysterious to us at times. Like, notice the way the story finishes in Nineveh. Look at verse nine, which this is actually the end of the king's proclamation. Verse nine, who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. This is not like some bold statement of faith, right? I mean, Notice what they don't know. They don't know God's covenant name, Yahweh. I've told you this before. When you see the word, the Lord, and Lord is in all caps, that's the way that the the translations translate Yahweh. You don't see that here. They say maybe God will relent. That's the more generic Hebrew word for God, Elohim. So they don't know his name. The pagan sailors knew his name. Jonah revealed his name to them. I worship Yahweh. But to them, they they only, they just are kind of like, maybe God will relent. They don't know his name. 
But not only that, they say, who knows? <laughs> who knows? God may relent and have compassion. Like, maybe. They believed God. They came under conviction, but their faith was not some astounding proclamation of God's infinite mercy. It was a plea. It was a cry for help. It was a laying of their very lives on the mercy of the court of heaven that maybe God might have compassion on us. We're not told that they made sacrifices to God or any vows like the sailors did. We're not told that they destroyed their idols. We're not told that they went through the city of Nineveh and started decimating all their temples. We don't see any of that. We're only told of them turning from their violence. They were pursuing to be a more just society and they were throwing themselves at the mercy of a God that they really didn't even know. And this violent, cruel, brutal, imperialistic, unjust society was trying to be a little more just and they asked for mercy. It was a small but important step of repentance. And what happens? Verse 10, when God saw what they did, and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. How mysterious is that? In fact, as we'll see next week, Jonah didn't find it mysterious. He found it ridiculous. And he was mad. How? How can this be just of God to do? The word of the Lord came to Jonah, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Not might be overthrown, will be overthrown. And now God's gonna grant mercy on these wicked people? They aren't in covenant with him. I mean, history shows several decades later that they would actually go in and ransack Israel. And then God, through the prophet Nahum, is gonna, gonna basically tell them like Babylon's gonna come take you out. And they do. So I'm not so sure, commentators are on both sides of this, I'm not so sure that, that we see saving grace here. I don't see a nation that fully repents and comes to God. But now in this time and place, they did receive mercy. They didn't get what they deserved. And how can this be? Have you ever felt that way? You ever seen somebody in your life just receive mercy from God and you're like, I know they don't deserve it. They deserve way different than that. Have you noticed God offer compassion and kindness to someone who is completely and utterly unworthy? How do you feel about that? Yet, are you worthy? Am I worthy? See, this is why most of the time when it comes down to it, many of us today, we just don't like the idea of a God of wrath. We don't like an idea of a God of justice, a God who would come and judge the earth. It makes us uncomfortable because it offends, one, our modern sensibilities. It's just not how we talk about God. But more than anything, it offends us because who on earth could stand in that moment? Who of us could stand in that moment? But we're conflicted because also as J.R.R. Tolkien in Lord of the Rings, some of you got real excited. Some of you were like, what? Through Sam Gamgee, here's what he says. Basically, Sam Gamgee's asking a question of Gandalf. But the question is, will, all, will someday all sad things come untrue? Because at the, heart, at, the, at the very elemental heart of the human nature, we just want all sad things to come untrue someday. But here's the problem with that. The only way all sad things can come untrue is if a just God makes an upside down world right again. It's for him to execute justice. But brothers and sisters, how? How can he end injustice and violence without ending us. How? 
How can all sad things come untrue when it's our own sin and missteps that actually cause the sadness in the world? Wouldn't that mean that we would have to fall under his just wrath? It would, actually. And we know it. We know we aren't fully just, not on our own. We want mercy too. In fact, we want grace. You see, we don't just want mercy, not getting what we deserve. We want grace, the unmerited favor and blessing from God. But brothers and sisters, we don't just want mercy and grace. We need it. We need it. We want to be here to enjoy when all sad things come untrue. Don't you? So how can we get there? Well, like Kevin alluded to last week, there's a clue for us, not really a clue, it's pretty cut and dry in Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 verses 23 through 26 reveal the mystery behind the mercy and grace of God. Here's what he says. This is Paul. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I'm going to stop real quick right there. I don't have time to go through this passage. It could be a series, not just a sermon. But I, I want to spend a minute just to explain what he has done this, part, this far in Romans is to explain how a church in Rome made up of Jews and Gentiles can coalesce together to make one family and what God was doing all along in this process. And so chapter 3, verse 23, he's showing that there's a level playing field for us all, that we've all fallen short, Jew, Greek, Gentile, all of us fall short of the glory of God. But notice what he says in verse 24, that we're all justified. What? We can be made just, we, we, can, we can be justified, how? Freely by his grace through his redemption that came by Christ Jesus. That there's only one way to be justified and, and redeemed and that's in Christ Jesus. But notice what he says in verse 25. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance and his patience, God had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Basically what Paul is saying, like before this, people might could look at God and be like, you're not just. You left Nineveh and didn't do what you said you were gonna do. And it's not like they were really any better than when you showed up. How's that just? He says, no, he can't be accused of not being justice because even though he beforehand left those unpunished, in Jesus, now he has absorbed the wrath of God. He has become the sacrifice of atonement, the propitiation on our behalf. And then notice verse 26. Why did he do it? He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time. And brothers and sisters, catch this. So as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Christ. You see, God can be both just and he can justify you. How can God end violence and injustice without ending us? There's only one way. That we would come under the safety, protection, and love of God through his son, Jesus Christ. This is how John in 1 John 1, 9 can say that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us of all unrighteousness. That he can be both just and faithful because to exact punishment, to exact payment for our sin from us when we are in Christ is double jeopardy. He won't do it. God is faithful and just, and he is just and the one who justifies the ungodly by sheer and total grace by believing God, believing in Jesus Christ. And before you think to yourself, like, I don't know if I have enough faith for that or belief in that, notice God's desire to show mercy is so great that he grants it to the Ninevites on their limited understanding of who he is because he delights in showing mercy. It's not how much you know about God that ushers you into mercy. Rather, it's the object of who you're trusting for mercy that makes all the difference. It's not how much faith you have, but the object of your faith that justifies you. 
Some of you today may be like the father, I think it's in Mark 9, <clears throat> who says, if you believe all things are possible, and the father goes, I believe, help my unbelief. And God meets him where he is. So as we close today, I have kind of a exhortation both to us as a church and then to us as individual people. First, just as a church, in the world in which we live now, you, you see <clears throat> a lot of kind of categories, again, like people that kind of end up pigeonholing themselves in one area or another. So you have a lot of churches that are all about preaching God's justice. But they're very, very rarely the same churches that are actually getting involved in God's justice in their community. At loving the broken. At looking after those who can't look after themselves. And then you also have people that are all about social justice. But they shy away from a God who's holy and just. In church, we should be both. We should be a both and church that stands on the word of God unashamedly. But it's all about what God has called us to be about in our community for the good of our city. Jeremiah says that, that when the righteous are in a city, the city rejoices. That, that should be the way of us, those that have been made righteous in Christ. Our being here should cause our city to rejoice. For the individual, whether you would say like, I'm a follower of Jesus or not. First of you would say like, I, I'm still, still checking them out. Maybe you're online just checking them out. What are the claims of Jesus? For you, I'm pleading with you, I'm imploring you, believe God. Come to Jesus and say, I know that you're my only hope. Would you come and save my life? Because I want all sad things to come untrue, even the sad things that I've done and caused, I want them to come untrue in you, Jesus, and I want you to fix me, to redeem the broken parts of me. If you are a follower of Jesus, it's the same call. Believe God. Whatever areas of your life are still pulling you away, pulling you into despair, pulling you into darkness, get under those deeds and look at the root and believe God. The gospel is God's word of justice. With the bad news being that we are not inherently right with God in and of ourselves. But it's his powerful word of justice because the good news is that Jesus absorbs his wrath on the cross for those who would believe in him. God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in stead fast love and he works with mustard sized seeds of faith because Jesus is massively merciful believe God today and instead absorb his mysterious and wonderful mercy so that it can change you from the inside out let's pray Our Father, we are uh, just humbled. We're humbled by your mercy, by your patience. That yet another day, as the psalmist says, that we have gone to sleep and we have risen back up the next morning for you to sustain us. You are so unbelievably good to us. And so I just pray this morning, Father, that you would 
By your spirit, give us the eyes to see and the ears to hear. Help us to see the deep-rooted beliefs in our hearts that are causing us so much pain. And help us to start there. Would you grant us faith and would you show us what we're believing that's false, that we can believe you and that we can come and walk in the mercy and grace that is available to us in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Would you do it, Lord? Would you do it? In Jesus' name, amen.